Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar on JBL IntelliVox loudspeakers beam shaping technology presented by Keith Caggiano. My name is Laura Lawrence and I'm the Global Marketing Director at Harman. So just a few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep noise levels down during the webinar. However, there is a chat function where you can submit questions to the presenter and they'll try to answer as many questions as possible. This webinar will also be recorded and the link will be made available a few days after this presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control. And we'd like to encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our Learning Sessions Workshop Series on pro.harman.com, as well as visiting Harman Professional University to see our many on-demand and certification courses, and they're all available to you for free. And now I'd like to introduce you to my colleague, Keith Caggiano, the presenter for today's webinar. Keith has spent his career focusing on the design and implementation of large-scale sound systems for both live performances and permanent installations. Prior to his current role as business development manager for installed performance systems, he served as the product manager for the JBL IntelliVox series. Now I'm going to pass the mic over to you, Keith. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so, as uh, Laura just mentioned, uh, I'm the uh, uh, business development manager for installed performance systems. Uh, previously, I worked with Duran Audio uh, on the IntelliVox line of products uh, and then came over to Harman along with them. Uh, today, I'm going to take you through the, the basics of what IntelliVox is, uh, how it's used, uh, and how it sits in the market, things like that. Um, it's, a, it's a lot of information crammed into a relatively short amount of time, so uh, we'll be open to questions at the end of this and uh, can review things a bit. All right, so a little history to begin. Uh, Duran Audio is the company that initially released the IntelliVox line. Uh, all the way back in 1996, they came out with the first uh, commercially available IntelliVox product, which was the IntelliVox 2C. Uh, this used technology that we commonly hear of today as beam steering. Uh, they continued to make technological advancements uh, throughout the years. In 2000, they came up with the, the concept of DDS, which is Digital Directivity Synthesis. Uh, and later on in 2004, this was actually introduced into the line of products, and they made a full update to the range of IntelliVox products uh, using this. And this is what we've referred to today as beam shaping, uh, which is uh, fairly advanced still in the field even today. Uh, in 2014, Duran was uh, brought into the Harman family, uh, and they're, we're still all making uh, IntelliVox today. Uh, an important thing to note uh, that though Duran Audio developed and manufactured the first digitally controlled column loudspeaker, uh, the theory behind loudspeaker arrays goes back for decades, uh, as far as even the 50s. Uh, over time, people have tried different physical formats uh, and circuitry to kind of harness the capabilities of arrayed components uh, while managing the varying effects it has across frequencies that make up audible sound. And these are a few examples here. As I said, going back to the 50s, you can see a very early rendition of a column array that used uh, some coaxial drivers in the middle to reduce the amount of high frequency at the extents of the column. Uh, you can see another one that came on later in the 50s, uh, as referred to as the barber pole. Uh, this actually rotated the drivers around uh, the column to distribute the high frequency that way, maintaining low frequency control of the column. Uh, and here's another one in the early 60s that used a physical baffle to try and manage the frequency response. Uh, and all the way over on the right here, you're going to see what we most commonly see these days in performance systems, and that's going to be a, a curvilinear line array. Uh, and this is actually going to use waveguides and, and mechanical adjustment between inner box elements uh, to, to control the coverage pattern. So there are a number of different kinds of loudspeakers, array, uh, loudspeaker arrays available today. Uh, technically, an array is simply multiple sound sources that are arranged in a manner to create a coverage pattern that's not possible with just a single source. Uh, but the two that we most commonly think of today are going to be the curved line array or the concert line array system, whatever you want to consider it, uh, and the column line array. Uh, the main difference between these two is how the high frequency is managed. 
Uh, if you look at the curved line array system, as I mentioned a second ago, uh, it uses mechanical controls to, to point the sound in the direction it wants it to go. So it's using waveguides to control the dispersion, uh, and it's restricting the interference uh, between the elements of the array in the higher frequencies. Uh, a column array, array loudspeaker, which is what IntelliVox falls under, uh, it's going to actually rely on a much wider dispersion uh, at all frequencies from all of the drivers. And it's going to take advantage of the natural interference that happens between the drivers uh, to focus the coverage pattern that's emitted from the overall loudspeaker. Uh, and then it's going to use either circuitry in a passive column, or in the case of IntelliVox, it's going to use DSP and onboard amplification to maintain as linear frequency response as possible and control the overall uh, directionality of that beam that's created. The two, though, have in common uh, low frequency control. So no matter what you're talking about here, the longer your array is, the better low frequency control you get, and it's the coupling of those drivers and lower frequencies that's giving you that pattern control. Now that we know what kind of a loudspeaker IntelliVox is, uh, the next question is what is it going to be used for? Uh, in any space, the listening experience that a person has is a result of the acoustics of that space and the background noise. Um, as the room reflections and or background noise encroaches on the direct sound, the intelligibility of the original source can be obscured or even lost in some cases. So what happens if we make an effort to reduce the amount of reflected sound and consistently overpower the background noise? Get a much happier listener. The ultimate goal is to maintain good speech intelligibility, which is measured using the speech transmission index, which is the STI scale that you see at the bottom of the screen here. Uh, stated in a different way from previously, the two primary factors that reduce intelligibility in a space are the direct to reverb -in ratio and the signal to noise ratio. And if we think of IntelliVox as a spotlight uh, versus a conventional loudspeaker, which would be more akin to a floodlight, we can see the benefits of focusing the sound just on the audience and maintaining even SPL and frequency response across the entirety of the listening area. The IntelliVox range has uh, three basic categories here and multiple products within each one of those categories. Uh, the main, the standard product lineup is going to house different length columns. These are going to start with the DS-115. Uh, go up through the 180, 280, 380, 430, and ultimately 500. Uh, these are all named in terms of their height in centimeters. We also have a high-powered range, which comes in two different heights. And then we also have an analog uh, version, which is a passive column, works on a 70 volt or 100 volt line. Uh, and there's two models in there. There's a horizontal and a vertical unit. Going a little bit more specifically into the specifications here, uh, the standard IntelliVox line uh, goes up to five meters, which is going to be your, your DSX 500. Uh, the, they offer a constant SPL up to as much as 70 meters or 230 feet. That's going to be with the tallest column there. It's going to be progressively uh, increasing when you go from the smaller columns, shorter columns up to the tallest. Uh, the horizontal coverage is averaged at about 130 degrees across all these products. Uh, and they're comprised of four inch drivers and horn loaded tweeters. Uh, the only exception to this is going to be the DS115, which has a couple of coaxial high frequency elements in the bottom drivers of the, of the unit. Uh, these all take advantage of DDS beam shaping, which is Duran's algorithm. And some of the typical uses for these include house of worship, education, transportation, uh, and just any other large spaces uh, with high reverberance or just difficult acoustics. The IntelliVox high power range, as I mentioned before, has two models within it, uh, the tallest one being 12 feet tall. Uh, they're naturally IP55 rated for after use. This is without any modification. Uh, the max SPL out of these is up to 105 dB at 30 meters, so roughly 100 feet away from the, from the loudspeaker. You've got a horizontal coverage of 100 degrees, and it's comprised of six and a half inch drivers with coaxial high frequency compression drivers at the, uh, the lower unit of the, of the column. Uh, overall, it's a little bit larger than the standard IntelliVox running line, but still pretty compact at eight inches wide and seven and a half inches deep. 
And again, this uses the same DDS algorithms that the standard line uses. Uh, typical uses for these are going to be um, really anywhere where you need the extra SPL over distance. So whether that means there's high background noise in the case of some transportation, rail stations, those kinds of places, or in sports complexes where you have high crowd noises, um, or even in larger houses of worship, or in some cases, live music reinforcement as well. The last group that we have is the uh, ADC line, which is analog directivity control. Uh, so this is gonna differ from the standard and the high power range in that there is no onboard DSP or amplification. These are passive columns. Uh, they're for use in 70 volt and 100 volt systems and they have fixed uh, coverage pattern. There's a vertical column, which is the one you see here on the left column, and uh, in a horizontal, the one on the right. It's important to note this is the only horizontal one that we offer. Uh, columns in general only control your dispersion in relation to the orientation of the drivers within it. Uh, so the horizontal one has to be mounted horizontally and doing so gives you a 40 degree horizontal coverage pattern uh, and then roughly 130 degree vertical coverage. Uh, whereas the vertical, the ADC V90, gives you about a 30 degree dispersion vertically and it has a fixed down angle of four degrees. So that allows for uh, distributed mounting on, on columns or on walls or wherever, uh, wherever that comes into play. Uh, these are primarily used for distributed systems in transit and life safety markets, uh, and they are EN 5424 certified. And the rest of what we're going to talk about here is really about the standard and high-powered Intellivox line. This is all going to be the powered DSP controlled products, not the, uh, not the analog ones. Uh, the basic components that reside in each one of these products are going to be a Class D uh, multi-channel amplifier, which is going to vary depending on which model you're you're dealing with. Um, it's going to have logarithmic driver spacing, which is what you see over on the right side here in this image. Uh, and the reason for that is that you get to use fewer components, so it keeps the cost down, it, it increases the efficiency overall of the product, uh, reduces grading lobes, uh, and, and it's lower power consumption overall. Uh, they all the products also have onboard DSP. Uh, so this is going to have eight built-in presets that can be recalled over the network. Uh, they have two inputs, uh, which allow for automatic uh, failover or, or summing, uh, and they each have some input processing on them. Uh, there's also output processing available, and then within the column itself, you're going to get the DDS algorithm, which is creating the coverage pattern uh, through use of FIR filters, gain shading, and, and delay. Uh, these also are fully monitored. They have surveillance features built in using our control software uh, that allows you to view the uh, status of the, of the column and the health of the column overall. So before we look at what the DSP and the algorithms that we use are actually doing for the array, we kind of need to understand the basics of what the underlying array theory is and how that impacts it. So basically, as I mentioned before, an array is a collection of loudspeakers that is assembled to achieve a radiation pattern that can't be achieved with a single driver. Uh, sound waves that are emanating from each one of those drivers or sources are gonna sum in the direction that you're aiming. Uh, and in other directions, they're going to cancel. Uh, cancellation is going to be relative to the wavelength at any given frequency. So this is where control over that wide spectrum of, uh, of sound wavelengths is important. So as wavelengths increase, the array length also has to increase in order to control those frequencies. As wavelengths decrease, and the distance between array components has to also decrease in order to still have control over those, over those frequencies. Uh, all this sums up to a driver spacing at half a given wavelength affords the maximum amount of cancellation off axis uh, and then ultimately summing in the on axis direction. And what you're seeing in the table down below is just your wavelength in meters uh, relative to frequencies. So we can see that we have an extraordinarily long wavelength at lower frequencies all, all the way up to a very, very short wavelength at higher frequencies. And this is the 
audible spectrum that we're trying to control using these products. So if we focus on those bullet points that I just mentioned, uh, we can look closer at the impact that quantity and spacing of the sound sources or the, the drivers, the components of any one of these uh, loudspeakers has on the overall coverage that's emitted from the loudspeaker. Uh, for the sake of example, uh, we're going to use perfectly omnidirectional sources. Uh, in reality, the coverage pattern of each array element uh, is going to impact the overall pattern of the array. And also keep in mind that what we're looking at here is just vertical dis uh, distribution. Uh, so in the horizontal plane, if you were looking down on this driver, uh, all of the drivers would be perfectly in line with each other, so there would be no pattern control in the horizontal. Uh, so any one of these products, any, any uh, column array that's on the market uh, is only controlling frequency coverage in the vertical plane. And that's a really important thing to keep in mind. You don't, there's no steering horizontally with any of these products except for the, the one horizontal ADC product that I mentioned because it's physically oriented in the horizontal. Uh, on the left side, uh, you're going to see a gray, grid that shows the resulting dispersion of sound at increasing frequencies as we go left to right. So increasing frequencies this week way, uh, and increasing number of sound sources going top to bottom. And we're going to maintain the same spacing between these. So in essence, we're just increasing the overall array length. Uh, the right grid is going to show the resulting dispersion at increasing frequencies with a fixed array length by increasing the spacing between the components within the array. So if you look at going across here, again, we're increasing frequency. You can see our pattern is getting tighter. Uh, and as we go from top to bottom, we're going from uh, a static array length of 2.72 meters here, top to bottom, but we're going to increase the distance between the sources within the array from 0.17 to doubling to 0.34, doubling again, and doubling again. Uh, and what this is going to reveal, let me switch to our next slide here. So uh, the key takeaway on the left side is that as we increase in frequency, we need a shorter overall array length to maintain a similar radiation pattern. Uh, so for the sake of constant directivity, you don't want to use as many loudspeakers or as long an array length at, high, at one kilohertz as you would down at 125 hertz because you're going to have a much tighter pattern that you will appear, and it's uh, basically much easier to get out of the pattern of the high frequency, and, and you won't have constant directivity. Uh, on the right side, uh, we reach a point where the space in between the sources becomes too great, and the main lobe starts to break down, uh, and it's overpowered by the, the off-axis radiation. So, Basically, when we exceed one wavelength at a given frequency, we reach the point where the summing is going to happen much more significantly off axis to that main lobe, and it's going to be destructive, and it's going to result in uh, lack of control and distribution of, the, of that at that given frequency. So as we can see, this is only going up to one kilohertz. As we get higher and higher in frequency, this spacing needs to become tighter and tighter and tighter. Uh, and and the amount of elements and the array length overall that we need becomes less and less and less. So all of this is, again, to give an example of the wide range of sound frequencies that need to be managed uh, in order to get uh, coherent coverage out of the column. So at this point, we've seen that even without manipulating uh, in any way, uh, just the basic physics of arraying sound sources is already beginning to create the directivity uh, that we're trying to achieve to get this spotlight versus floodlight coverage. Um, what's left at this point is managing all of the variables, like I just mentioned. Uh, so all of these various frequencies and the overall aiming of the beam that's been created. Uh, and that's where Intellivox uses an advanced algorithm that we referred to before as digital directivity synthesis, DDS. Uh, and this is what we colloquially call electronic beam shaping. What you're seeing here is a uh, example of the power of DDS and its ability to cover multiple configurations. Uh, these are still fairly basic planes, but it's showing very even coverage at varying heights and at varying listening plane uh, angles. 
Uh, and down below, what you're seeing is a whole bunch of different coverage patterns that can be generated using uh, this algorithm. Uh, everything from a, a complex a multi tiered space like this, uh, a complex beam that appears to have multiple beams emanating from it, but this is actually still one coherent beam, uh, to other uh, just complex coverage patterns. So what you see on the left uh, is going to be standard beam steering. Beam steering is what we find most commonly in the market today. Uh, it's got fairly limited control. I should also mention this is beam steering is what the very original Intellivox products came out as, uh, the 2C and all that, and then they progressed into the DC range of products, which some of you may be familiar with. Uh, those were all beam steering products. Uh, in 2004, that's when DDS and beam shaping was integrated into the Intellivox line. Um, with standard beam steering, you have very limited control. You have a vertical opening angle, which is gonna be your vertical coverage, uh, and you have a throw distance, and usually some kind of, a, of an aiming distance from the, from the column. Uh, you can typically do multiple beams, which segment the array, uh, and can cover different planes. Uh, and it's really only ideal for pretty basic audience planes because it doesn't have the ability to uh, give you independent control in the near field versus the far field. On the other hand, DDS and beam shaping, it gives unrivaled beam control. Uh, it really has unlimited coverage possibilities because it's contouring specifically to the space that you're in. Uh, it also has unrivaled frequency response because the algorithm is optimizing for both SPL and frequency across the entirety of the listening plane. Uh, and it's creating a single coherent beam, even if it's a complex audience plane or multiple uh, balconies or anything that's you know something beyond what you're seeing in these two images, it's still a single coherent beam. Uh, and it does give you independent control of the near field versus the far field. So you can tell it to give even coverage, even very close to the array as you'll get very far off. Whereas with beam steering, you really have to rely on, on being consistently off axis to this column in order to get, uh, to get very even coverage, which means you're much more restricted in, in your mounting height for a beam steering product. Uh, a couple of examples here. Um, if you do try to use beam steering uh, on, on a more complex audience plane, uh, and the only way to really do that is to use multiple beams. Uh, very quickly, when you start splitting the beams uh, on, a, on a standard beam steering product, A, you're reducing the overall column length and performance. Uh, you're reducing the intelligibility because in this kind of an example, you have multiple beams that are going to conflict with each other at some given spots within the uh, within the room. So as you can see here, we've got areas where there's multiple beams that are conflicting with each other. And in these areas, you're going to lack coherence. Uh, you're going to have uh, re just reduced intelligibility all over. Uh, and then in these other areas, you're going to have significant hotspots where the physical beams are focused. When you look at what beam shaping does, it's taking the entirety of the plane into account, and it's a consistent uh, frequency response and uniform coverage across the entirety of the plane. So you don't get any of those hot spots. You don't get the loss of intelligibility. So some of the key Intellivox advantages. Uh, physically, you get very long, or the, the potential of very long column lengths. Uh, five meters is a very long uh, column. Uh, it gives you very strong low frequency control and, and pattern control in even the most reverberant spaces, cathedrals, whatever you can think of. Uh, the DSX models, which is our primary line right now, uh, these have tightly packed high frequency elements, so they give better control at higher frequencies. Uh, and then on top of that, we have some DSX HD, which are high density models. This is going to be the, the middle two products, the 280 and the 380. Uh, and these individual drive those HF elements uh, as opposed to the others which drive them in pairs. Uh, and this way you get better articulation and better shaping at those higher frequencies. Um, in terms of the technology, uh, the list of advantages is quite long. Uh, it's a fully customizable beam shaped for, for the space that you're working in. Um, so you really get unsurpassed coverage control and unlimited possibilities. 
uh, the FPL and frequency response. The FPL and frequency response is uh, optimized across the entirety of the listening plane. Uh, and DDS is driver agnostic. Uh, this is a really important fact. So the algorithms, uh, as long as they know the parameters of the drivers uh, and components they're working with, uh, they don't really care what it is. So there's no hard crossover between any of the physical array elements. Uh, it's not like the four inch drivers go up to a certain frequency and then the, the uh, horn loaded high frequency elements take over. Uh, they'll take advantage of whatever frequencies are available in any of those drivers to create the coverage pattern that they need. Um, you can easily create custom arrays by stacking multiple units uh, or multiple uh, loudspeakers and, and control them as a single unit within uh, our control software or our modeling software. Um, DDS can be used for the alignment of subwoofers along with Intellivox products. Uh, and basically, again, it's seeing all these products as a single unit, regardless of what the uh, what the actual components are. Um, it can control subwoofer arrays for shaping and steering, uh, and it can theoretically be applied to any loudspeaker uh, or array for any pattern and uh, response optimization. So next we're going to talk about what products uh, to choose for a specific project. Um, the first consideration is always going to be how far do you expect the system to cover. Uh, there's a, a guide here on the, on the right that shows you basically the range of coverage distance that you can expect to get out of the varying heights uh, of columns and how that compares maybe to a conventional uh, loudspeaker over here on the left. There's also a guide in our brochure, which gives a really good starting point for how far uh, you can expect the, each one of the products to cover. Uh, and as you can see here, you've got everything from the, the shortest column, the DS-115, which will on average shoot somewhere around 50 feet, all the way up to the 500, which is gonna give you coverage as far as 230 feet away from the loudspeaker. Uh, and again, for the high powered versions, you'll see down below here, we have similar thing, the shorter column will throw around 75 to 80 feet, and the taller one as far as 165 feet. So this is a great starting point. This is gonna be the first place that you wanna look, and then from that point, you can refine whether you need a, a taller or maybe shorter column, given the, the environment that it's in. So the second consideration is gonna be the acoustic properties of the space that you're installing this in. Um, in a higher uh, RT environment, you might need a, a taller column than you would think for the throw that you're trying to cover. Um, basically, the taller the column, the better low frequency control you're going to get, as we saw earlier. Uh, so that you're going to have increased intelligibility because you're going to have a tighter overall pattern throughout the entire listening frequency range from that product. Uh, what you're seeing here is a cross section of your coverage from a DSX 380. So that's going to be a 3.8 meter tall column versus our five meter column, the DSX 500. Um, so in the horizontal, you'll see the coverage looks fairly simple, similar. Uh, and again, this is averaged across the entire hearing spectrum for, for, for the sake of example here. Um, but the coverage pattern itself looks fairly similar. Uh, when you look at this in terms of the STI rating that it's generating in the room, you're gonna see a much, much better result with the taller column. Uh, we're looking at this in, in plan view on here, and then also in graph view. Uh, it's sometimes it's easier to, to visualize it this way, because this is telling us that more than half of the audience area is getting as low as 0.45 to 0.5 STI in this, in this case, uh, whereas down below here, you're seeing more than 70% is 0 .5, 0 0.05 above that. Um, a caveat that I want to say for STI, these are not exact numbers. This, these are here for the sake of comparison between the two uh, between the two possibilities, and they're just for example purposes. Um, your the the resulting uh, STI you can get in the, in the space is going to be based on the acoustics and the placement and and many other factors within the space itself. So this is just for example. Uh, another consideration might be mounting restrictions that you have within a space. Uh, we do have uh, 
two different variants. The standard product line is the DSX. Uh, that's the one I was giving the uh, components of earlier. Those have the additional high frequency elements. Uh, we still do offer as a variant the DS, which is all four inch drivers, uh, which have an overall wider dispersion and therefore uh, allow for a wider beam, which might be used in a higher mounting application. Uh, it's important to note that whenever possible, the best placement of a column is as close to the audience plane as you can get. Uh, the higher you go, which I think is, is shown here a bit, uh, the wider the vertical beam you need to cover the space, which typically has a, a detrimental effect on the overall intelligibility in the room. Um, so this is a consideration that might come into play if you're restricted by architecture or something else, but in general, uh, placement of the column is paramount uh, and does need to be looked into significantly. So the next consideration is going to be some design approaches. This might overlap with the previous one a little bit, but the other one might be a restriction, whereas this may fall more into personal taste or, uh, or aesthetics. Um, so one consideration you can look at, what happens oftentimes, especially in very reverberant spaces like churches, uh, cathedrals, those types of things, is some, some designers like to look at a single source as the most coherent way uh, of getting the best intelligibility in a room. Uh, that, may be, that may be right, and in this instance that I'm demonstrating here, uh, you can see the difference between a single loudspeaker mounted on just the right side of the room here uh, versus a pair, symmetrical pair here. From the SPL perspective, it does look like your coverage is better with the pair, but when you look at the resulting intelligibility in that room, having the single source and reduced wall reflections and uh, a litany of other aspects, uh, you end up with somewhat improved overall uh, speech intelligibility. So that is one consideration. Uh, this may go out the window when the client uh, you know, has a preference for the, the visual aesthetics. Somebody may want a metrical system just for the sake of how it looks. It's not to say that you couldn't still control them independently and, and try to obtain a coverage similar to this and, and use the benefits of the one-sided source. Um, but uh, that is a consideration. Another aspect that you might look at is though uh, Intellivox has exceptional control and, and coverage possibilities, uh, maybe it's not always the best idea to take full advantage of that all the time. Um, the example I'm showing here, we have either a single DSX 500 in this case, which is covering a main seating area and a balcony. And we can see kind of what that dispersion is going to be across the near wall uh, versus using that same DSX 500 just to cover a main floor and then having delays for the balcony. Uh, you may find that there's, you know, doing delayed or distributed fills along with a main column to cover uh, a main seating area may result uh, in improved STI. And in this case, you can see somewhat of an improvement using the delayed system. Uh, the main reason for that it's not, has nothing to do with control. It has to do with the fact that you're just distributing all this extra energy through the room uh, that isn't necessarily uh, needed if you use the delayed fills. So there's a lot of power that you have behind these products, um, but how you actually apply them is going to be dependent on the actual space itself. If this room has a very, very low RT, then this is probably not a problem at all and covering the entire room from the single column will be, you know, much lower budget, much easier to install, and, and it may be a superior solution. Whereas if you're in an extraordinarily high uh, river burn room, then a distributed system along with uh, the Intellivox solution may be uh, a beneficial way to go. I mentioned a little bit before some of the uh, power of what DDS is actually able to uh, to to do, uh, and what it what it can the manipulation that it can offer for for multiple products. Um, there, these are just a handful of examples of custom configurations that you, you could do with, uh, in this case, with a, a DS one hundred and eighty product. Uh, in reality, this could be any Intellivox product, 
um, or or varying IntelliBox products. They wouldn't have to be the same ones. They could be comprised of, say, a 500 and a 180 if you wanted a, an exceptionally long column. Um, that may be, you know, in, in some really long throw applications or extraordinarily high reverberant spaces, something like that may be uh, a good choice. Um, but here's the coverage pattern that you can expect out of just a single CS180. Uh, to the right of that, you're going to look at a hybrid column, which is going to be two DS180s with their high frequency components put together. Uh, I should mention, uh, and I, I may mention it later on, but all of the IntelliBox products can be ordered with the amplification and the DSP module uh, at either the top or the bottom of the unit. So if you were doing something like this, you could order it with the uh, with the uh, amplifier module at the top of the unit, which would put it basically at the low frequency end of the column, and then you could couple the high frequency to it between the units, and what you result, the resulting coverage pattern could be a, a tighter pattern, uh, extended coverage, um, and you end up with a, a much taller column with additional SPL out of, out of just two fairly basic IntelliBox models. Uh, down below is going a, a little bit uh, creative here. So, as I mentioned before, any column array is only controlling uh, the coverage pattern in the orientation of the column itself. But if you're, the array that you create has drivers oriented both horizontally and vertically, then all of a sudden you have the ability to control 3D coverage entirely. Um, so, what you see down below here is a very complex coverage pattern, which is steering not only uh, down onto the floor, but also over to the left. Um, the, if you need uh, a really tight beam or for some reason you do need a beam that's steered off to one side, this might be an interesting uh, experiment for uh, really anything you can think of, a theme park, a railway, anything like that where you have a really unique situation. It's good to know that these kinds of possibilities do exist and this could be done just right off the shelf uh, using our standard products and our uh, modeling software. Uh, finally, another example on the right, uh, on the bottom, is going to be a cardioid array. So this is going to be two DS-180s back-to-back -back in this case. Uh, and what you can see here is the amount of rearward rejection that you actually get out of doing this. Um, so this is actually an example as well of something that could be done with subarrays or anything like that, where you really can reduce the amount of rearward firing energy. So again, I'm just illustrating that the, the potential uh, of DDS is is pretty high. Um, so pretty much anything that you, any creative combination that you can think of, uh, it, it can uh, accommodate. So after all that, now that we're talking about IntelliBox, uh, JBL also manufactures and sells CBT. Uh, and these two actually do play together pretty nicely. Um, one good example of that is the uh, the, the example I gave earlier of the distributed fills, the delayed uh, fills in the room, uh, those were actually using CBT-100s. So as a, as a fill speaker or a side-by-side -side system, something like that, um, CBT actually works very well alongside IntelliBox and, and may in some cases help reduce the overall budget uh, or, you know, it's, it's really a great product for, uh, for basic coverage. Um, they both work on the, the original kind of physics that I was talking about earlier of column array technology. Um, the big difference between the two is going to be that the CBT is a passively controlled loudspeaker. The IntelliBox is, is DSP controlled and, and self-powered. Um, so the CBT is going to be a passive loudspeaker. It's going to have switchable but preset coverage patterns, uh, and it's going to be mechanically aimed. So you're going to have to physically point at where you want the sound to go. Um, but there are a multitude of models that are available for increasing pattern control and increasing SPL. Uh, and some do have the ability to do further down coverage in the case of the CBT-70 uh, and, and 1000. These actually do offer a little more uh, pattern articulation than the standard models. So contrary to that, IntelliBox is now going to be fully digitally controlled uh, with self-powered uh, and internal processing. Um, it's really going to give the best pattern control available. Uh, the biggest uh, increase in performance that you can expect out of a digitally controlled column 
uh, is that you're overcoming the loss of 3 dB over distance, which a standard column array is going to have. Uh, so any of the passive columns are still going to uh, fall off at a rate of 3 dB for doubling distance. The IntelliVox is going to overpower that with a combination of DSP and, and your near field articulation uh, and, uh, and therefore get more even coverage over that full listening area. Uh, so it is going to give you the best pattern control available on the market. Um, the control and the aiming is independent of mounting. So these do not need to be physically pointed. These are going to be flush mounted uh, or even recess mounted into a wall or column or whatever you can come up with. Uh, and you're still going to be able to articulate them from that point. You're going to have extremely consistent SPL and frequency response over distance. Uh, and the models are going to increase in height uh, depending on the amount of SPL and the pattern directivity that you need to uh, accommodate. So that's how JBL products intermingle between themselves. Um, the next thing to think about is how do these compare, really how do any of these products, CBT, IntelliVox, anything like that, how do they compare to the outside world, to other products on the market or to other products entirely? Um, the first thing that's really important to keep in mind throughout all of this is, is all, all of those initial uh, physics and array theory that I, that I was discussing, those are true to any product that's out there in the market in terms of an array. Um, so your LF beam control is governed by the acoustic length. So a longer acoustic length is going to give you better low frequency control, period. Uh, the steering and shaping that you're getting out of these products is destructive. So if you're doing really extreme steering, uh, and this is this kind of ties back into before where I was saying your mounting height is paramount. Uh, if you do go to a very high mounting position and you need to steer really far down or really far up or whatever you have to do, that steering is destructive and it's going to reduce the overall amount of SPL that's coming out of the out of the column. It's also going to create uh, extra artifacts in unwanted directions, extra lobes that uh, you may not want. So big consideration to uh, to put in place there that even though something can steer really, really far, it may not be a great thing to, uh, to do that. Um, lower constant SPL uh, over distance, sorry, that's misprinted. Uh, consistent SPL over distance uh, relies on keeping the audience consistently off axis of the main beam. Now, the, the DDS algorithm uh, overcomes this a bit because it does give you the ability to independently control the near field versus the far field. But in general, uh, an array does need to be placed at an optimal height where they can keep the main lobe of the, uh, and the, the main energy passing just overhead of the majority of the audience so you do get that consistent SPL front to back. Uh, and as I said, DDS does overpower that to a degree. Um, but still, if, you, if you're pointing an array right in the front row of space, you're not going to get that same energy level at the, at the back of the room. Um, and finally, splitting beams reduces the overall column length, effective column length, and it reduces the overall SPL. So if you are trying to cover a complex area and you're using multiple beams, you're reducing the performance of that column. Um, the next thing to look at is testing standards. It's very difficult to compare any of these products on the market. Um, everybody uses uh, a distant, a distant, different uh, testing procedure or or uh, parameter. Uh, so all the specifications are not necessarily comparable. So this is true in terms of SPL coverage distance, uh, low frequency control. All of these aspects need to be really dissected in order to make sure you're comparing apples to apples. Uh, whenever possible, it's important to compare products in a common prediction platform or even in real world testing if possible to really see what the common uh, performance is going to be. All right, moving on. Uh, we have a prediction and control platform, which is called DDA. Uh, this is Digital Directivity Analysis. Uh, it's a 3D modeling environment that was built for use uh, with the IntelliVox products, uh, but it also works with any CLF file. So whether that's a JBL CLF file, which exists for most of the JBL products, including CBT, or whether it's uh, another manufacturer's uh, common loudspeaker format file. Uh, either way, it'll, it'll 
predict any one of these. Um, you can import models in here from EDS, CAT, Odeon, or SketchUp with a, with a plugin that we have available. So the creation of the model itself is, is very easy. Um, and within the program, you're able to predict direct SPL, uh, direct or reverberant ratio, SDI, frequency response, all the plots that you've seen earlier in this presentation have all been uh, generated in DDA. Uh, and DDA is also able to generate the precise beam files that you'll need uh, to load into the, into the unit. Uh, I should mention, as you'll see on the next slide, that there are shortcuts. There are ways that you can um, that you can control them without having to do the full-blown model. And there's also a way, there's also a plugin that you can use with an ease so that you can uh, examine them with an ease without doing this. Uh, but DDA gives you the the the, the most uh, control possible uh, in terms of what your coverage pattern is actually going to be and the most precise beam. Uh, so you can generate it in here and export uh, to be used in ease or other program, programs as well. Uh, this is a free program. It's available on the website, on the JBL website, and there's no licensing or anything needed. Uh, Wind Control is our control software. Uh, this is the software that allows you to upload the files that you created in DDA. Um, you're able to set the beam configuration also without DDA. That's what I was just talking about using this uh, graphic interface right here, which gives you basic parameters to get the coverage area that coverage that you want. Uh, it pulls from a preset library. Um, and, uh, and it has access to all of the DSP control parameters. So your parametric EQ, your delay, um, your surveillance uh, parameters, pilot tone, priority switching, preset selection, all that. This is also available for download on the JVO web website and also is unlicensed. We have a very similar module uh, that you saw that's in uh, wing control uh, for use in ease. So this is what the easy LLGL looks like. Uh, so again, you have very basic controls here. You can set your mounting height, uh, your throw distance, where you want coverage to start, where you want it to end, your seating height, and it's going to pull from that library of preset coverage uh, to give you uh, for use in ease. Um, you can also load directly the actual beam file that you create in DDA. So if you do want to get more specific, uh, you can create the file in DDA and then you can import it into ease using this module. We have uh, several options available for the Intellivox products. Uh, the first and the most noteworthy is that we have the Intellivox DS range. Um, some of you may know these from uh, from previous years. We had these listed as uh, as primary products. We've gone to the DSX being the primary range, but the DS is still available. Um, so in some applications, as I showed before, it may be desirable to use these in place of the DSX. Uh, the amplifier module position I also mentioned earlier. So this, they can, any of the units can be ordered with the amp at the top or the bottom. Um, the uh, power in the U.S. here is 115, but another version is available at 230 elsewhere. Uh, we do do RAL color matching, and we do have a range of, of uh, brackets and, uh, and adapter boxes and plates and things like that. I'm going to wrap this up with some examples of places where they are and kind of the benefits in those spaces. Uh, so one of the first ones is going to be transportation. Um, it's it's really ideally suited to these places. And what you see on the right here um, is JFK Airport, where you'll see the two columns up here. These are 500s. Uh, and also here in Grand Central Station, over on the wall here, you can see another pair of 500s. Um, so what you can gain in these very large spaces are a lot of the benefits we talked about earlier. So you get consistent SPL and frequency response over these long distances. Uh, you get improved intelligibility uh, because of that. Uh, so you get, uh, you can, if there are kind of uh, SCI requirements that are in place um, by the transit authority, these may be the only viable way to get this because you know, obviously in a place like Grand Central, there's no place for ceiling speakers or distributed systems. So this may be the only way to achieve the, the coverage and the intelligibility you need. Um, finally, uh, there is a redundancy built in and there is system monitoring built in that comes into play in these kinds of applications. 
large venues, sports complexes, arenas, those kinds of places. Again, this is the place where consistent SPL over distance, because these are very long throws, uh, comes into play. Um, and uh, sometimes the redundancy and system monitoring also comes into play here, and the high power uh, and overcoming background noise is paramount. So these are both examples of using the HP series. Um, this is the HP 370 here, and these are the shorter uh, 170s or the predecessors to the 170s over here. Uh, hospitality, um, how's the worship, education, all those kinds of things. Uh, these are very, very low profile. So installation uh, in an unassuming way is very easy, whether it's flush mounted or recess mounted, as I mentioned before. Um, it really improves intelligibility. Uh, and you can also get some really complex room coverage. So if you do want to keep as low profile system as possible and have it flush mounted, but you have a complex listening plane, then this may be the only way to achieve even coverage in a space like that. And this applies for both the high power units and the standard powered unit. And another example of education and, um, and government buildings as well. Um, so in some cases, you'll see these in courtrooms and things like that. Uh, really good game before feedback where there's a lot of microphones in play, uh, reduced microphone bleed, um, improved intelligibility. Uh, you don't necessarily need to have very high SPL in order to have the intelligibility. So for, for slight vocal lift, these are really exceptional. Um, and that's true in, in both kind of the courtroom application or in the education lecture hall type application where you don't really need high SPL, you just want pattern control and consistent SPL and frequency response. Got a, a few more notable uh, examples here. I'll just scroll through quickly. Now, some of these are easier to see where the columns are actually mounted than others. Uh, obviously down here, they're pretty obvious. This one's a little bit harder to see because they're down there on the columns. Um, and then uh, the Grand Mosque here where they're actually on the outside of the building. Uh, some parliament buildings, courtrooms, boardrooms, uh, again, where they're really low profile and just give you the coverage that you need and control you need. And finally, a few more transportation examples, uh, railways, um, where distributed systems, again, were mounted down here very inconspicuously in, in columns, um, built into the columns here in this airport. And then the example of JFK and also Grand Central here as well over here on the side in Grand Central. Uh, and so those are a few set, uh, examples uh, that summarizes uh, Intellivox in a quick overview, I think. Uh, so I'll open it up to questions now. Okay, I can see a couple of questions that came in. Um, okay. This question, when do you use Dante and Ethernet control? Is the question, I'm sorry to say that again, is it available or when will it be available? Well, it said when Dante and Ethernet control, I wasn't sure if they meant when do you use or when will it be available? Uh, okay, probably when will it be available. <laughs> it is not presently available, it is being worked on, so that's about as much as I can say about that one. <laughs> Okay, perfect. Um, and then there was a question asking if there's any new Intellivox speaker models planned in the near future. Um, well, we're we're constantly working on uh, on developing advancements in the product line. Uh, again, I can't really talk about uh, what's on the roadmap down the road, but um, but it is it is being uh, considered and worked on. Okay, there's another question. Um, does the Intellivox cover PA Live Music? It can, yes. So um, the standard Intellivox range uh, is uh, sometimes not quite enough SPL that you would need for live music. Uh, so the HP line is usually more appropriate for those applications. Um, and it's also important to note that most of these products are intended for intelligibility. So their prime use is, uh, is vocal range. Um, and this is really across the board. And, and the main reason for that is that you can't control 
you know, extremely low frequencies. Uh, so you do have to keep in mind that, you know, if you're using these for live music or for a music system in general, uh, you do want to supplement with subwoofer and you do need to realize that you will not have the pattern control at those lower frequencies. But yes, it is, uh, is definitely musical and it's definitely usable in, in those applications. Okay, the next question is asking, what is a grading lobe? Uh, so a grading lobe is an off-axis lobe that's uh, sound audio audible lobe at a given frequency that's emanating in a direction other than your main lobe, which is the main coverage pattern that you're trying to uh, adhere to. Um, so grading lobes occur when you get to those frequencies where you start losing control uh, over the overall uh, control of that frequency. Um, they start emanating in directions off-axis from where you want to go. Um, in a system that doesn't have the resolution that ours have, uh, that starts happening at lower and lower frequencies and becomes audible uh, and disruptive as well. So all of these, if not managed, uh, can create reflections throughout the room that are definitely unwanted and they can reduce intelligibility by reflecting off ceilings or floors um, and they can, yeah, just in general be uh, disruptive. Hope that answers it. Next question is asking, is it controllable with AMX? Uh, so preset control can be done, yes. Uh, you, can, you can control it, um, but the, so if you, the, the application for that would typically be if you have a space where you want um, multiple coverage patterns for different, uh, different scenarios, performance scenarios. Um, which might be the case if you're uh, in a room with a balcony and sometimes you want balcony coverage and sometimes you don't. Uh, you can access and you can recall presets, the built-in presets, and each one of those presets would have a different coverage pattern uh, built into it. So, so yes, it can, at that level, it can be used uh, to control uh, from AMX. All right, the next question is, does DDA software use any simulation techniques like the ray tracing or mirror image method? It does not. It's not intended to be a replacement for ease. Um, so you do want to think of it as a powerful uh, prediction software in 3D modeling environment, but it's not doing full-blown ray tracing. Um, well, sorry, ray tracing. Um, it does give you the ability, as I said, all that, all those STI charts that I was bringing up, those were done in DDA. Um, and, you know, it's, it's important to note that any modeling software is going to be as good as the information that you input to it. Um, so DDA does let you input um, surface materials uh, and absorptive coefficients, all those things. Um, so you can get pretty fine-tuned and you can get relatively uh, good uh, SDI readings and, and indications, um, but ray tracing is not one of the features that we have. Here's the next question. Um, DSX 500 is such a long speaker. Is it possible to put 2 by 280 upside down? Yeah, so yes, absolutely. Um, so that goes back to my hybrid array uh, example there. Um, there's a uh, there, there's a number of different ways you could actually go about that. Um, the, the important thing to keep in mind is that when you're doing that kind of a thing, the high frequency section of these products is at the bottom, uh, just above the amplifier module. You can order them with the amplifier module at the top of the unit, which in essence puts the, it flipped over, then puts the high frequency section at the top of the column. And you can pair two of those together. Um, and not only does that give you a taller column, but it also doubles, doubles your uh, horsepower basically. So you've now got two columns doing the work of one, so you will get extra SPL, uh, you will be get, get a little bit better control. Um, so that's definitely uh, something that can be used and modeled in DDA to really see what the possibilities are. Okay, the next question is, can you further explain how such a small section of horn-loaded tweeters can steer such small high frequencies so far off axis? <laughs> Well, again, um, what I mentioned before uh, is extreme steering is usually not something that's beneficial. So when you say how it's steering it so far, um, we're not recommending you steer high frequency more than say 20, 25 degrees up or down. Um, so it's, it's not uh, steering that extreme. 
Um, the, the horn loaded tweeter that's in there does provide some pattern control uh, and it, it actually restricts the amount that you can steer at those extreme uh, frequencies. Um, and that's why in some applications, I mentioned before using the DS variant uh, may offer you a, a wider coverage pattern. Um, so it's really important to think about where you're placing these so that you don't have to be steering these at 50 degrees down or something like that. You know, there are limitations and there are downsides to doing that. Um, there are other manufacturers, other products on the market that, that claim to be able to do these really, really extreme steering angles. Um, the downside to that is usually when you're doing that kind of a thing, every action that you do has an opposite and equal reaction, right? So if you're steering at 70 degrees down, there's usually a fairly significant lobe that's going 70 degrees up, uh, which is going to reduce, it's going to induce um, ceiling reflections and reduce your overall intelligibility. Um, so it's often not a good idea. Uh, getting back to Intellivox specifically, um, it is a short uh, section of uh, HF units. That's that's true. But uh, you also have to keep in mind, again, there is no hard crossover. So just because we've got the addition of these high frequency elements at the bottom, that doesn't mean that we're not also taking advantage of the high frequency capabilities of orange drivers above that. Uh, so to get some of these more complex coverage patterns, uh, if you actually look at what the filtering is doing uh, in DDA, which you, you can look at once you've generated your coverage, uh, you'll see that there'll be high frequencies coming out of various uh, uh, four inch drivers above the high frequency array um, that are adding to the uh, articulation of the overall beam. All right, the next question, can we use delay systems with multiple IntelliBox units with or without external DSP? Oh, yes. So each, uh, all the DSP that's built into the IntelliBox has built-in uh, delay um, and, and gain and all of that. So you can, if you're doing an IntelliBox system, you can put as many out as you want, distribute them however you want, and you can, uh, you can set all of your delay and, and all of your gain just using wind control. Uh, and once you do that, it, it resides within the amplifier and you can walk away and that's, that's that. Um, there is actually also a nice feature in DDA that allows for automatic um, optimi optimization of those delay times. So if you're doing a complex area, uh, you can actually ask it to calculate what the best delay is. Um, this, it could be arguable that, you know, somebody wants to take advantage of the hot spec, something, something else like that, where you want to implement a different delay time, fine, but uh, it will take into account all of the various listening positions within the space, and it'll give you the best average delay. Um, so if nothing else, it's a great starting point, uh, and it can kind of, if you model the space correctly, it'll give you a great starting point that you can then just implement the settings exactly from DDA into, uh, into your uh, live system and then work from there. Um, in, in DDA, you can, you can take it to the level of manipulating the, the delay settings yourself, gain settings yourself, you can put in EQ settings and you can, uh, you can manipulate all of that and you can also you know, view the resulting uh, coverage and, and frequency response that you get out of it. So DDA is a powerful tool to be able to kind of do that in advance. Um, but yes, you can do this just as a standalone, put all these up, uh, distribute a, you know, a, a single feed or a stereo feed, whatever you want to distribute, uh, and control it within the, the units themselves. Great. Right, the next question is, how can we control the PRX sub the same as working with the Access UV25G2? I'm sorry, say that again? Sure. <laughs> it's a mouthful. Um, how can we control the PRX sub the same as working with the Access UV25G2? Oh, UV, okay. So, um, I, the, the bottom line is, okay, so this is being pulled from the brochure. Um, so, we recommend, uh, if the UV25 is still on there, that's not a product we make anymore, unfortunately. So there were a range of products that Duran Audio made. Um, they had a whole line of access products, and those were uh, conventional loudspeakers uh, and subwoofers that all could be controlled within DDA. Um, 
presently the, the PRX sub does not have the same internal DSP that Intellibox does. So you would basically be taking using it just to set a, a static crossover with the rest of the column. Um, so it's not really, you're not controlling those two as a, as a single unit, but this, uh, it is a fairly uh, affordable and, and good sub to use along with uh, the Intellivox. Uh, the main benefit being that it is a powered sub, uh, so it, it does uh, work very well in, in those situations where you're already working with a powered system. Here's the next question. Um, in the presentation, you show that the Intellivox has presets. How is it possible to change the coverage as you need it, for example, in a college coliseum? Yep, so that goes back to uh, the question about AMS earlier. So the A presets can be preloaded with whatever coverage patterns and whatever Q settings, gain settings, all of that that you want. Um, so in, in any one of these scenarios, you could set it to cover uh, one preset could be the entirety of the room. Another preset could be, you know, just the, the main seating area and not a balcony, whatever you want to do. Uh, and then those presets can be recalled either using wind control uh, or it can be controlled from an external controller like AMX. All right, the next question, does calculating STI require a closed model in DDA? Yes, it does. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I generally recommend, um, I don't want to get too deep into the software, um, but the if you have a model that's built in Ease and you want to com uh, compare between the you know the two, you can import the model from Ease. If you're not using Ease and you just want to work in DDA, uh, there is uh, either a very basic 2D builder that's built into DDA to build the model, or you can use SketchUp, which is the preferred method uh, to create a, a 3D model, um, ensuring it's closed and then importing it to DDA from there. But yes, for, for any calculations of that level, you do need to have a closed model. Okay, it looks like that's everything that came in and I think we're at time. So I wanted to thank everybody for joining us today and thank you Keith for the presentation. That was great information. Just a reminder, this was recorded, so we will be sending this out um, early next week. So keep an eye on that. And if you wanna attend any of our upcoming webinars, you can find that information on pro.harman.com. Thanks, everyone, and have a great weekend.